When the merger between Boeing and Lockheed's business occurred, the merger promised in the press release $150 million of savings. Instead, there were billions of dollars of cost overruns. And entrepreneur Elon Musk explains how space exploration is launch constrained. Musk created SpaceX to drastically reduce the cost of launching payload into orbit. SpaceX was, was founded to make radical improvements to space transport technology, uh, with particular regard to reliability, safety, and, and affordability. We have top men working on it right now. Who? Top men. But what about powering space exploration? Most of our RTG fuel, the plutonium-238, was created a quarter century ago. NASA started producing more in 2013, but the worldwide shortage of RTG fuel is a perpetual constraint on space missions. And while our tiny supply of plutonium-238 can power exploration missions lasting decades anywhere in our solar system, the radioactive decay of plutonium really does not provide much power. Curiosity runs on 100 watts. Rolling across the surface of Mars, taking photos, grinding samples, detecting neutrons, monitoring the atmosphere, and sending all this data back to us, Curiosity does all this on two incandescent light bulbs worth of power. Our space missions will never match what we see in movies or read about in science fiction novels. This is an invisible constraint. The Martian is based on Mars Direct, a research paper written by NASA engineers. But the weight of the rocket fuel required for a round trip to Mars was so enormous it would render the launch ship impossibly heavy. We would split the mission up into two parts and we'd send the return vehicle out first with its own return propellant plant. So the propellant would be made on Mars. Before any humans land on the planet, Mars Direct uses a small unmanned nuclear reactor on wheels to power the creation of rocket fuel so that humans can get from the surface of Mars back up into space. Uh, it is 0653 on Sol 19 and I'm alive, obviously, but I'm guessing that's going to come as a surprise to my crewmates. That a starving astronaut's journey across Mars consists of repeatedly deploying solar panels, sleeping during the day while his vehicle recharges, and then driving at night is a realistic but unnecessary challenge created for dramatic tension. Had Mark Watney been abandoned during a Mars Direct mission, he'd have ample electricity to journey across Mars thanks to the small nuclear reactor on wheels he could tow behind his rover. Okay, it's not a giant nuclear power plant that powers a city. It's just a nice little putt-putt nuke sitting in the back of a truck. Look, I mean, I don't mean to sound arrogant or anything, but I am the greatest botanist on this planet. Similarly, Mark Watney rations his potato crop to survive 400 days on Mars. I now have 400 healthy potato plants. I dug them up, being careful to leave their plants alive. The smaller ones I'll reseed, the larger ones are my food supply. The carbon in Watney's potato crop tissue does not come from nutrient-rich astronaut poop. It comes from the carbon in the Martian atmosphere. Photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus photons creating plant tissue and emitting oxygen. Because there's no shortage of carbon or water on Mars, more photons means more potato. Artificial lighting means bigger potatoes than could otherwise be grown in Mars orbit. It's the difference between one half of Earth sunlight and as many photons as the potato crop can absorb. Hey, watch him. Oh my God, El Dorado. The legends are true. That is how illegal grow operations are routinely busted, simply by monitoring unusual behavior on the electrical grid. This is also why high yield urban farming requires so much energy. You want to see what minimal calorie count looks like? It has been seven days since I ran out of ketchup. 
Andy Weir put his astronaut on the brink of freezing to death and starving to death by downgrading the Mars Direct nuclear reactor to an RTG. Even so, nuclear power of some sort was still required, as the author explains. At one point I considered when he's on his long drive to uh, Schiaparelli, I thought, what if the RTG develops a problem? What if it leaks or something like that and he has to live without it? And so he like throws it away and oh. he has to drive away without it. And there's just no way you survive. <laughs> really? Just, you are dead. When you see a futuristic and inspiring space mission on the big screen, it's not being powered by RTG or solar. Well, what if NASA missions had access to far more energy? Most people don't appreciate how little energy NASA has at their disposal to design missions around. The most exciting missions are not even under consideration because we have no way to power them. We got one liquid water planet in our solar system and we've already identified three potential hydrospheres yeah. that are ice covered and far, far from the sun. Right. But so based on our own immediate experience, it's a three to one ratio. Sure, sure. Um, do we know if any of them are habitable? No, we don't, but we gotta go look. A mission to explore under the ice of Europa would be the ultimate robotic challenge. Solar is out of the question. Jupiter is too far from the sun. And batteries can't hold enough power to melt through a planet's outer shell of ice. We need something small, lightweight, long lasting, and extremely energy dense to power such a mission. Can I just give my favorite mission, which doesn't exist and isn't funded now? It would be to go to Jupiter's moon Europa, yeah. Yeah. which has an icy yeah, outer agree. surface. The gravitational stress on Europa from Jupiter and other surrounding moons is pumping energy into it, much the same way when you warm up a racquetball by hitting it. <laughs> You distort it, it bounces back to shape, you're pumping energy into it. That has melted the interior ice. It has had an ocean of liquid water that's been liquid for billions of years. And every place on Earth we find liquid water, we have found life. I wanna go ice fishing on Europa. Yeah. Lower submersible. Airspace is freaking cool, man. It's awesome to work on rockets and spaceships yeah. and everything, I love it. It's like in my guts, I love it. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. This was uh, O'Neill's vision back in the 70s. We all knew we needed energy, and solar energy sure seemed great. But this like really affected the way I thought. I was like, yeah, sign me up for this. There's no coal on the moon. There's no petroleum. There's no wind either. And solar power had a real problem. I worked a lot of my career in solar power systems. It's just that, that said, I'm, I'm a lot more aware of their limitations. The moon orbits the Earth once a month. For two weeks, the sun goes down and your solar panels don't make any energy. I knew Kirk Sorensen as a, a young engineer. I ended up uh, getting a job at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center at NASA. Dating back to NASA days when uh, we were looking for deep space power systems out there from Mars and, and the moon. Uh, and all the systems we had were just not going to make it. This is Mark Watney, astronaut, here on the Hermes. You basically point the bird in that direction, you wait 150 days, and 36 million miles later, we should be at Mars. Ion engines are real technology, they're not just invented for the book. Basically, they're particle accelerators that shoot particles very, very fast. So fast that the particles gain relativistic mass. Um, so oh, they, wow with less matter, you're getting more momentum change. So you need very, very little mass. All of the technology that you see in the book actually exists. However, some of it is better than our current incarnations. So we don't have ion engines anywhere near as powerful as Hermes has, mm -hmm. but there's nothing preventing us from making it. We know how to do that. Right. We could scale it up. And everything you do in space, um, because you're not, you don't have any ground or air or anything to push against, it all comes down to delta V to put yourself on a Mars intercept you need a delta V of about two and a half kilometers a second, which is about 5,000 miles an hour. You, you can't cheat the system in any way. You know, physics demands that you pay the price. And the amount of fuel you have on your ship determines the total amount of delta V you can have, period. And you need a lot of energy to do that. So you'd need a reactor aboard, which my fictional ship has. 
there were a lot of people who were saying, let's put solar rays out on Mars. Well, Mars has terrible dust storms. I said, if you were on Mars and you had these solar rays and they got coated by dust, you're gonna die. Take a look. Dust storm. Headed straight for Mars One base camp. Southern hemisphere coming from the east. These bad boys can cover a whole planet, last up to a year. Because now this time I was not particularly excited about nuclear. You know, I thought nuclear, eh, isn't that kind of bad or dirty or yucky? Or, and I just had this sort of vague distaste for nuclear. 